We're being recorded. So as you may have noticed, you can see us, but we cannot see or hear you. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and Temple will make sure that we see them. We will start off with three initial questions for our panelists. After those three questions, we will begin answering questions from you. We will also record this session and chat log and hope to post the recording to our CalWeeks website later this week. Lastly, at the end of the session, we will post contact information in the chat window just in case we miss a question or we miss a question or you come up with one that you want to ask after the session. So now that we've gotten most of those logistics out of the way, let me once again welcome you to our CalWeek information session for the genetics and plant biology and the microbial biology majors. For those of you who are new admits, which I assume most of you are, congratulations on your admissions to the university. We hope that you find this session helpful and that you will join Cal in the fall semester. Today we have three panelists to talk about the genetic and plant biology and microbial biology majors. First, we have Patricia Hellier, the academic advisor for both of these majors. Hello. Hi, everyone. It is really nice to meet with you and to talk with you today. My name is Patricia Hellier, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I've been the plant and microbial biology major advisor for almost five years. I've been an advisor in some capacity for about 10 and a half years total. A bit more about me as a person. I'm a first generation immigrant born in Colombia, South America, and raised in Massachusetts, where I received my undergraduate degree in English literature because I thought I was going to be a high school English teacher. Uh, I then changed careers and I received my master's in public health in Ohio, where um, I changed career focus and then moved to California here in the Bay Area, which is now my permanent home. Uh, before social distancing, I started getting into square dancing and I'm really looking forward to getting back to it. Um, I'm married, I have two dogs, and I love being part of your academic and personal journeys. And I'm really looking forward to getting to know you. Next, we have two of our peer advising leaders or PALS, Ada, Rachel, and Jenny. PALS, please share your name, pronouns, major and minor, if any, any student organizations or special programs you've been a part of at Cal. Hey everyone, my name is Ada and I use the she, her pronouns. I'm currently a junior double majoring in microbial biology and molecular environmental biology. In my time of, at Cal, I'd had the chance to help prospective and current UC Berkeley students as a Rouser College peer advisor and a Golden Bear orientation leader. I'm also on the pre-med track, so if you have any questions about being pre-med at Rouser or Berkeley in general, feel free to ask me. Hi everyone, my name is Rachel. I use she, her pronouns. I am a fourth year uh, microbial biology major and education minor. And I'm also involved in biology research on campus, as well as uh, Spectrum at Cal, uh, support, encourage, and develop for children, a STEM mentorship organization, and Cal figure skating. So excited to answer all of your questions today. And yeah, I'll hand it off to Jenny. Hi, everyone. I'm Jenny. I'm a genetics and plant biology major, and I use the She series. Um, some things that I'm involved with are, for example, I'm completing the SCET certificate, which is an entrepreneurship thing. And I'm on a committee in um, the SCET department. And I'm also going to be a GBO leader next semester, um, like Ada. And I'm also part of a few music orgs. So really, if you want to know more about music, um, entrepreneurship in like in PMB, and GBO, like you can, you can talk to me, you can shoot me an email. Thank you so much for being with us. We have a few questions that we want to start off with. And so I'm going to list them all now that so you and the audience can start thinking about them. After I read them all, then I will ask you in turn to call and call on you to respond. So first, Patricia. Can you describe to us what the genetics and plant biology or GPB and microbial biology or MB majors are and what are the course requirements? Absolutely can do. So let's start with uh, genetics and plant biology. Uh, genetics and plant biology or GPB for short 
combines traditional plant sciences like physiology, biochemistry, and morphology with more recent biological disciplines like molecular genetics and genomics to study the role of plants in the global environment. It emphasizes the study of plants from the submolecular levels all the way up to the organismal level. The other major that I um, advise for is microbial biology, or MB for short. It investigates interactions between microorganisms and the environment to determine the role microbes play in maintaining the health of our biosphere. That includes how microbes can help combat environmental pollutants, facilitate energy production, and influence the progress of medical research on infectious diseases. The course requirements for both majors are exactly the same for the first two years. Uh, don't worry about memorizing or jotting these things down. You receive them in June when we go through when you go through your online orientation program. But overall, for your first two years, you need two semesters of English, two semesters of calculus, and one of stats, one semester of general chemistry, two semesters of organic chemistry, two semesters of biology, 15 units or about four classes of humanities coursework, uh, and one semester of physics. Uh, the majors, so that's the same, exactly the same across both um, lower division or first two years for microbiology and genetics and plant biology. They get different at the upper division or junior senior level. So again, let's start with genetics and plant biology. GPB requires five core plant related classes that every student must take. Uh, the first one is physiology and biochemistry of plants. Second is plant cell biology. Third is plant molecular genetics. Uh, fourth is any course from our plant diversity and evolution concentration. And the fifth is an experimental plant biology lab. Then GPB students get to choose five courses from four categories or concentrations to complete the major. The names of those concentrations are biotechnology and bioenergy, plant diversity and evolution, plant genetics, genomics, and bioinformatics, or plant microbe interactions. At the upper division or junior senior level for microbial biology, uh, you need to have four classes that every student must take. And that's general microbial and lab, biochemistry, and microbial genomics and genetics. Microbio students then get to choose two core electives from a list of microbial biology specific classes and four courses from the following four categories or concentrations to complete the major. Post pathogen interactions, evolution or computational genomics, ecology and environmental microbiology, and microbial biotechnology. So you may have heard some of our peer advisors mention they're going to be GBO leaders. They're going to mention things about GBO. GBO is referencing golden bear orientation. In June, you will be completing an online orientation program called Golden Bear Advising, or GBA. It's a mandatory program where you will learn about all of the college and major requirements. Through GBA, you'll submit your planned schedule for fall, and an advisor will review it and give you feedback on it. You'll then enroll in your fall 21 classes in July. So don't worry, you'll be given all the information you need, including what fall classes you should take and how to enroll in them when you go through the online orientation program in June. Great, thank you so much for that information. Our second question is for our pals. What is it like to be a student in these majors? And what has been your favorite class or experience as a GPB or MB major so far? I guess I'll go first. So I would say that my experience in microbiology um, overall has given me a good mix between kind of larger scale biology research versus smaller scale biology. So I kind of focus in like microbial ecology, which is kind of looking at the population or, and community dynamics of microbes, uh, specifically bacteria. So I feel like the course offerings in microbial biology uh, leave me well equipped to do graduate level research in that topic and subfields. Um, my favorite course I would have to say uh, was also when I did not expect to be my favorite at all, which was um, PMB C148, uh, which is the genetics, uh, microbial genomics and genetics course. I thought I would hate genetics, but I actually feel like that class gives you the most like practical information about genetics and genomics moving forward. And I will remember 
most of those concepts going into my graduate studies. So I really thought the course was super well laid out. It's taught by three professors in the department. And yeah, that's why it's my favorite class. Um, I can go next. So even though GBB kind of sounds like a very specific major, there are lots of opportunities for it to be interdisciplinary. Um, even with my lab, like I was kind of introduced to the SEET certificate through my lab, which was kind of crazy to me. So um, overall, I would say I've had a really good experience. Um, I really, um, for example, PMB 160, which is the molecular plant genetics course, it has really, um, it's been kind of a pH test for how much I do like plant biology. And so far it's been really great. Um, it's also taught by three professors, um, one GSI, the class size is not big at all. Um, so there's a lot of attention for each student, each student and things like that. Um, so yeah, I would say GPB is a great major and it's also very popular with pre-med students. So even if you're not super um, interested in plant biology specifically, it's still a great bio major to go into no matter what you're interested in. I would agree with what um, Rachel said about microbial biology as a major being, um, you know, even though it's about microbes, you can make it as focused as you want um, because I'm majoring, I'm double majoring in MEB as well. So I've had to, I've had the chance to take um, courses that are outside of the plant and microbial biology department, but also make progress towards both of my majors. And I think that's what's really good about um, this major as well. Um, personally, I really like the lab courses on campus because it was a way for me to apply what I had learned um, in lecture and hopefully in-person instruction for the fall semester will allow you all to experience it as well. I would say that my favorite class is plant physiology and biochemistry, which is taught by Dr. Mellis. Um, and you will learn once you get to Cal that the professors really make a lot of difference here. Um, I heard a lot of good reviews about the professor and I'm actually taking another one of his classes this semester. So um, the professor makes a lot of difference in the college course because the way that they teach could change the way that you look at a certain subject that you might have had um, some reservations about like biochemistry is often feared a lot by a lot of students and I really enjoy it now. Awesome, thank you so much. Our next question is also for our pals. What profession do you hope to have after graduating? And I'll save the next one for Patricia. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, after graduating, I plan on going to graduate school for my PhD in microbiology. I was accepted into University of Wisconsin-Madison for their microbiology doctoral training program. So I'll be going there um, in a year because I deferred uh, since I am working as a lab technician in Jennifer Downer's lab of all places. So I'll be able to get some practice uh, practical training on what I am going to be doing in grad school and beyond. And after grad school, I either hope to, you know, go into academia and become a professor or potentially go into either local or larger scale science policy slash organizing. Um, let's see, I, since I'm still a sophomore, I'm not too sure of um, if I want to go into a job right after college or if I want to go to grad school, but um, after exploring the startup and um, what is it? After exploring the startup space in the Bay Area, there are a lot of ag companies, so agricultural companies that I can go into and really use the knowledge that I've learned from the SCET certificate and bio research. Um, so that's something I'm currently eyeing right now. Um, after graduating from Cal, I hope to go on to medical school um, and study to be a doctor, but I'll be, I'm planning on taking a gap year um, to get all of the application materials ready um, and apply the next cycle. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is for, for Patricia. What are some of the careers that alumni have pursued? 
Yeah, so um, these are really good questions. I think oftentimes students ask, it's nice to work backwards, like, well, what can I do with this major, right? So what can I do with GBB? What can I do with microbiology? Both majors mimic the requirements for medical school. Ada mentioned she's pre-med. And there's other health science profession schools that also um, the majors help you prepare for. They also help you prepare for graduate school in a number of fields, as Rachel has um, demonstrated, but she's going on to do her PhD. Um, if you want to work right after school too, and you're not particularly interested in going into graduate or professional programs, um, you'll find that the experience you gain in lab research and the challenging courses will be invaluable on your resume. So that's totally an option too. You can just go right into the working world without necessarily pursuing a postgraduate degree. Um, both degrees prepare students for careers related to biology and the environment, uh, generally, such as scientific research in government, industry, or academia, biological assessment for various governmental agencies, the tech industry is big, uh, software engineering and computer programming, there's some of the courses in microbiology specifically, um, teach you some com computer, programming, excuse me, computer programming skills. Um, students also pursue a range of careers extending beyond the field of biology, such as human medicine or health professions, uh, environmental or science education, biotech, or non-technical work in writing, illustration, photography, or legislation. Uh, some of our alumni have gone on to become, um, I'm just going to list some titles and places where they are actually working, uh, scientific program analyst at the National Human Genome Research Institute, Microbial Engineering Research Associate at Synvivia, which is a biotech startup, uh, no, yeah, Networking Security Operations Engineer at Jenny Craig, uh, a lab tech. Many students right after um, graduating become lab techs um, at, at various places throughout um, the Bay Area. This particular student was a, is at Stanford Healthcare. Um, clinical Research Assistant at Boston Children's Hospital and a wildlife biologist at Sequoia Ecological Consulting. So consulting is another option if you wanted to do that with a biology degree. Um, graduate in some graduate programs include data science, dentistry, ecology, education, medicine, molecular biology, nursing, optometry, physician's assistant, and public health is also probably maybe the most popular after some type of microbiology program. Great. Um, so this was a good start for our questions, and now we're going to open up questions for you all to ask us. Um, and we will start with a first one that came into the chat. Feel free to type your questions into um, the chat right now or the Q&A. I believe you have access to do that, um, and we will, we will get to them. So our first question is, Rouser is a small college. Are the courses in the first two years in large classes with students from other colleges? And when do the courses get smaller to reflect Rouser's population of students? Piers, if you guys wanna go ahead. Yeah, um, so I would say like for the first two years, you are in a lot of large classes with students from other colleges, especially because the lower div requirements in uh, MB and GPB are almost exactly the same as MCB and IB over in Letters and Sciences. So you'll be joined by a lot of MCB and IB students as well as people from other majors. Um, but it's always good to note that uh, when you're in large lecture courses, you will always have discussion sections. So that means you split off once or twice a week into a 20 or 30 person class. Usually it's like 20 and under. And that is where a graduate student instructor will go into that week's coverage uh, more deeply in a smaller setting. And I'll also say that uh, campus-wide requirements like reading and composition or an AC course, those can definitely be small. Um, reading and composition are always pretty small, um, definitely like 50 or less students in each class. Um, so that is like a general requirement that is a small course. And then uh, like Patricia was talking about before, once you get to your junior and senior courses, that is when courses uh, do become uh, smaller uh, and you feel a little more immersed into the Rouser community. Okay, um, Jenny and Ada, if any of you have anything to say at any moment, just unmute and add to it. Um, I'll go ahead and ask the next question. How easy is it to find research opportunities on campus? 
Is it competitive considering the population of undergraduate students? Um, I could probably answer this one. I was able to get into a lab in my second semester of freshman year, which is typically like it's not very common for people, especially like LNS or the other colleges. But yeah, I would say that as long as you have a solid application um, and a lot of passion for what the research lab has, um, it shouldn't be too hard to find a research opportunity. And I wanted to add on to that um, by saying that at, in, sorry, in Rouser, we have a research database called SPUR, which is a sponsored program for undergraduate research. And that is basically a Rouser only place where you can apply to up to three faculty initiated projects or student initiated projects if you have an idea of your own. And you can apply to those projects and see if a professor accepts you. Um, it's less competitive than URAP, which is an uh, undergraduate research apprentice program to everyone on campus, not just browsers. So what you could do is apply through both URAP and SPUR, like as soon as you get onto campus, because you absolutely don't need to have prior research experience to get um, a lab experience um, on campus. I didn't have any research experience before coming and I also got a position in my second semester freshman year. And then um, my biggest tip would be to cold email professors. I tell everyone this who asks about research. So that means directly emailing a professor saying like, hi, I'm interested in your work because I saw X paper of yours and I would like to help out in X way. Um, would you have any opportunities available uh, for research in your lab? And usually professors will get back to you. And that is a way to kind of cut through that red tape and just, you know, directly ask professors if they have space and you'll likely be able to find an opportunity that way if you email a lot of professors. Yeah, that's actually how I was able to get my position in second semester. Um, I cold emailed a professor and then I applied to her. Um, I applied to her lab in SPUR. Um, in the next cycle. And because I cold emailed her, she responded right away and I was able to get in. I'd also like to add that um, to make yourself an even more competitive applicant, you should really take advantage of your summers. Um, like Rachel mentioned, a SPUR or sponsored projects for undergraduate research is also available um, for students to apply in over the summer. And that's a really good um, oh. thing to take advantage of because a lot of students end up not applying to that to spur over the summer. Um, and rather they just save to do it over the school school year, like in the fall or the spring. But if you do it in the summer, I think you'll be set to get a research opportunity. Um, and I believe there's also SERP, S-U-R-P sponsored or I'm not exactly sure of the acronym, but um, it's hosted by MCB USA, and that's also a good um, application site for UC Berkeley undergraduates um, for looking for summer research opportunities. That's all really great advice. Thanks, friends. Our next question is from Margot. She says, for students specifically, um, what research have you gotten in involved in, and how did you get that opportunity? So we heard a little bit about that, but if I, any of you want to expand on it. Um, <clears throat> I could probably go. So my lab researches powdery mildew in grapevines and Arabidopsis. So basically we're trying to find an RNA pesticide um, that specifically targets the genes. Um, like the most important genes in powdery mildew. So yeah, it's it's like trying to find an environmentally friendly and um, what is it? it? Yeah, an environmentally friendly pesticide that also keeps um, the, the pathogen from gaining immunity to it quickly. Yeah, so for me, for the last three years, I've been researching in the uh, Koskela lab, which is actually an integrative biology lab, so IV lab. Um, I guess one thing to also note while we're here is that you can, you don't have to just be involved in labs within Rouser. You can totally 
apply to other labs um, on campus in the College of Letters and Sciences or Engineering, et cetera. Um, so what I've been doing in the Coscala lab is related to uh, tomato leaf microbial ecology. So how do beneficial bacteria on tomato leaves kind of organize themselves? How do they protect the plant from disease? Um, how do they survive in different environments? So I've been answering kind of those kinds of questions for the last three years. And then over in the Doudna lab, what I have been doing part-time and will be doing the next year is working on microbial community editing with CRISPR technology um, in like a, in infant gut communities. So baby gut communities, as well as a synthetic, I believe, uh, bioreactor community that was used for bioremediation. So I'm really excited for that. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, our next question is from Anthony. Do you need to include a resume when you email professors to apply to their research? Yeah, I mean, you don't have to, but if you feel like it would be useful, you totally can. Um, if you don't have a resume on hand, that's totally fine. They might just follow up by saying like, hey, like, thanks for reaching out. Would you mind sending me your resume? Um, when I cold emailed uh, Britt Koskella over at the Koskella lab, I don't believe I attached my resume, but she did actually ask for a writing sample. So a couple of professors might actually have requirements on their website asking, um, if you want to apply to this lab, please submit a writing sample that's um, like a scientific research paper or whatever. I didn't have like a science research paper because I, I just didn't write about science topics in high school or like get any publications out. So I actually ended up submitting like an AP, um, or sorry, not an AP. It was a research paper about AP courses. So like it was very like humanities related and that was sufficient for her to look at and be able to tell that I was able to, you know, like demonstrate basic research skills. Great, thank you. What is the student community like at Rouser College and how is it different from some of the other colleges like LNS? So I would say that um, as an LNS transfer, I've actually had like experiences in both colleges. So I would say when I was in LNS, things felt pretty, um, it just felt really big because it is like the largest college on campus. So a huge benefit of Rouser is that it is really small compared to the other colleges. And that kind of changes the dynamic of everything. Like we have a lot of Rouser specific programming, like the PALS, for example, who enhance our advising program very much. And um, we also have a lot of events for Rouser students that kind of really makes the community more tight knit. And when I got here, because um, other people told me that's what Rouser was like, and I can confirm that it's true. And I really enjoyed that community, um, even though I've only been here for two years as opposed to four. So yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with Rachel. I feel like I have never had experiences in LNS because I came in um, as a CNR major, but um, it's really easy to find like-minded people who are really passionate about the environment and biology. And yeah, the people in Rouser are super fun. I echo that. Now we have a question for Patricia from Devin. Devin would like to know, when can we first meet to plan out our course schedule? Thanks Devin for um, bringing this question up because I'm gonna get it a lot over the summer. <laughs> so I mentioned earlier that um, this summer in June, all students who are gonna be attending, whether as first year students or transfer students, you're gonna be doing Golden Bear advising online. And that's basically, um, 
program where you have to go through certain modules and it's going to start with like here are all the university things that you need to know and then it's going to get smaller 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 until it gets to here are college of natural resources excuse me browser college of natural resources things you need to know and then here are major things you need to know and it's going to give you all of the major requirements that you have to satisfy and it's going to give you a suggested schedule for your first semester whether you're a freshman or a transfer um, and then you are going to it's going to actually be more information than you really know what to do with honestly it's going to be kind of a little bit a lot <laughs> um, but you will have all of the information you need um, after you do that you're going to submit online through that golden bear advising portal a schedule to myself and I might be working with another advisor and me and that other advisor are going to look over specifically what you think you should take. Mind you, you're not going to be like stabbing for things in the dark. I will have sent an email telling you, you should take X, Y, Z thing, right? So then you submit your schedule and then an advisor looks at it and tells you, yep, this, this looks good. Or, hey, this looks like really, really heavy. I'm not sure this is a good idea. Or how about this other thing? And there'll be like a communication back and forth. So after you have done that in June, in July, you will actually enroll in your fall 21 classes. So there, um, after you've done your Golden Bear advising in June, if you still have questions, you're welcome to make an appointment with me. Our next question is, is it possible to major in these majors while in the College of LNS? I'll go ahead and answer this as well, yes. Basically, any student can do any other major or any other minor in or outside of our own college. So if you are a genetics and plant biology major or you're a microbial biology major and you are interested in music, you can 100% do a music degree, a second music degree, or you can do a minor in a completely unrelated topic or a related topic. Yes, you can do anything you want. Um, there's just, you have to think about timing is, is all. So if you do a second major, you get one additional semester in order to complete both majors. If you do another minor, you get no additional time, but you do get one overlapping course that counts for both the minor as well as the major that you're currently enrolled in. But yes, you can pursue whatever you want in or outside of the college in addition to your declared major. Thank you. Next question is, are there significant differences in coursework between Rouser and LNS in the first two years for MB versus IB versus MCB majors? Rachel, do you wanna talk about this one a little bit since you? Since I've been in all three. <laughs> yeah, so I tried out all three of those. Um, lower division requirements, the only difference is that both MCB and IB require you to take Physics 8B, although you may not be surprised by that if you are pre-med, because if you're pre-med, doesn't matter what major you take, you have to take both Physics 8A and B. Also in IB, there is a one unit seminar that is also required, but that's like a really fun class. You just kind of watch per, like a different professor every week talk about their research. Um, so I actually ended up taking that and I would honestly recommend it to people even like outside of IB, although I'm not sure if there's like enrollment restrictions for that. Um, but yeah, seminars in general are good to attend. But in terms of like the difference between uh, the courses, it's just the physics and then that one IB seminar. Thank you. Um, next question. It it's a good question. Is it a good idea to sign up for courses with Summer Edge since the classes start before advising in June? Yeah, I will answer this one. So it depends on what you're gonna be taking in Summer Edge. Um, so Summer Edge um, will possibly allow you to do your American cultures requirement, uh, which every single student has to do on campus, regardless of major, every single Berkeley student has to complete American cultures. So if you do that, it advances your degree progress, which is nice, right? It takes a course out of your fall or spring that you would have had to take um, during your um, academic career at Berkeley. Um, it also kind of eases you into the Berkeley pace of things, uh, which might be nice. Um, so, and it, it might also open up so that you can take some breath coursework and or some preparatory coursework before you start your calculus or your chemistry. There's some courses that don't necessarily count for the major, but that can really help prepare you for Chem 1A 
or for your first semester of calculus if you haven't had a whole lot of preparation for that in, in high school or if you haven't other, taken other community college coursework. So I would say particularly if you would really like to brush up on those types of things, then yeah, I think um, edge over summer is a fantastic idea. Also, you can get your American cultures coursework done. Pals, do any of you have any experiences with Summer Edge and would you like to speak of them? Okay. All right. Our, it looks like our last question is here. And it's are other op, are there opportunities to shadow in hospitals nearby? And what other pre-med opportunities are offered at Berkeley? Yes, I can answer this um, since I'm a pre-med student. Um, for foreshadowing, there's a lot of opportunities um, because Berkeley is near, um, there's UCSF, which you can take the BART. Um, and there's, we have a Clipper Pass here at UC Berkeley, so you can take um, the AC Transit and then BART there, or you could just immediately um, take the BART. Um, so there's UCSF, which you can get in touch with the doctors there and ask if they'd like to have them be shadowed. Um, there's also the UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital, Hospital. There, they have locations in Oakland and in um, San Francisco as well. Um, and then there's also the Berkeley Free Clinic that you can volunteer for. Um, the Berkeley Free Clinic is pretty local. Um, and I know a lot of people who are involved um, in that organization. And it's really convenient because they have different sections if you're interested in different types of healthcare. Um, so they have like a medicine section, they have a dentistry section if you're interested in dentistry. Um, and then they also have a lab section. Um, so that's like if you want to screen um, like patient samples and stuff like that. So you can earn a lot of um, clinical experience that way and interact with patients in different types of ways, depending on what your interest in healthcare is. Um, in terms of other pre-med opportunities, there's a lot of clubs that you can join here at Cal. Um, if you're interested in Greek life, there's um, co-ed fraternities that you can join, um, mainly Phi, Del Phi DE. Um, and Phi, Phi Chi. Um, and there's also other clubs as well, like nonprofit organizations that you can join here that are student led. Um, so you won't run out of um, choices to look through. Really quickly, uh, one club that I wanna highlight is the, suit the Suitcase Clinic. Um, they provide healthcare for Berkeley's uh, houseless community. So I think that club is a really great way to understand how to work with more vulnerable populations as well as just get involved with um, healthcare in the local community of Berkeley. Thank you. Uh, looks like we got a couple more questions and we do have some time. So I'll go ahead and put those out there. How many incoming first year students having come in to the fall of 2021 in browser and how many of them are MB or GPP? Gosh, I don't remember. I know we 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 did the admissions process earlier uh, in February for and I don't know what the final numbers are, but I can tell you overall there actually I can pull it up right now and tell you exactly how many students are in each major right now, not necessarily the incoming, but just who all we have right now, all freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Right now in genetics and plant biology, we have 90 students. In microbial biology, we have 219 students. Um, that may seem big or small to you. I tell you, it's very small. Um, in molecular and cell biology, they have, I want to say it's over 600 students. Um, and so GPB might be the smallest biology major on campus, which has its benefits because if you're in a really small class with faculty, they may have a greater chance to maybe to get to know you a little bit more than if you were sitting in a class with maybe hundreds of people. <laughs> but yeah, so it's they're, they're pretty small biology majors. Thank you. How difficult is it being a microbial biology major in your freshman year? I'm a bit worried that I will be struggling, especially because of things like grade deflation that I've heard of. Can any of you speak to that? Yeah, so yeah, grade deflation is a thing here, I would say, but it's only a problem in like the lower division courses. And this is because, um, there's a lot of majors, or not a lot, but there are certain majors here that are impacted. So these lower division courses kind of have to weed out students, unfortunately. 
Um, but it's definitely possible to have a successful first year. I would say I did fairly well my first year. And it's all about accessing resources that are around you. So things like the SLC, going to office hours. Um, and I would say people also um, don't take advantage of going to graduate student office hours enough. So you will have a graduate student instructor for your discussion section. So they're often more in touch with the material than the professor is sometimes. So um, yeah, just as long as you utilize resources around you and also studying in groups is really helpful. Um, then you will be able to have a successful first year. I would also like to add that um, I do agree that grade deflation can be an issue, especially if you're trying really hard to have to like maintain a good GPA for graduate school or postgraduate plans. Um, I know that there are some departments here that have set requirements on how many people can get an A, B, or C. So if too many people are doing well in the class, they might. And even if you have like a 93%, it may come down to um, an A minus or I don't know, it might, yeah, it just depends on the department um, and the requirements that they set for the grades. Um, and I'd also say that it's difficult in lower division courses because um, students are coming in with different levels of mastery in the lecture material. So some students may have had um, taken advanced courses in high school. Um, so it's really different because there's also students that don't have or haven't had haven't taken that class in high school. So it's it's difficult like because everyone's just on a different playing field. Um, and like Rachel said, it's really good to take advantage of resources so that um, you don't fall behind in courses because um, the material goes by really fast, like a chapter each day. Um, so that's something that you should um, look into like the Student Learning Center. And one more resource that I wanted to share. So if you are a uh, first generation student or low income student, uh, you may have access to the Educational Opportunity Program, so EOP, and they have student advisors specifically advising EOP students and kind of, they can give you the inside scoop of like what the college experience is like um, as a first gen student. So you won't be alone in that sense if you identify with one of those categories. Great, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, so my next question is, is it possible to study abroad with the MB major? And if so, what courses are available abroad? Yes, it is 100% uh, possible to study abroad with uh, microbial biology or genetics and plant biology. Um, so our office just underwent um, a whole database situation that um, is new to students. So Ada, Rachel, and Jen, you may or may not know about it yet. <laughs> Um, I said that in my newsletter, so hopefully you, you might know. But um, so we now have a website that I've just posted in the chat so everybody can take a look at it. And if you if you click on it, it's gonna take you to like a planning situation, right? So it, it, it talks about like, well, what are your goals? Do you, what do you wanna do with study abroad? Do you wanna learn a language? Do you wanna see a particular part of the world? Do you wanna have a particular culture experience? Are you only interested in studying abroad? If you can advance your degree progress, meaning taking courses that count for the major. Um, so depending on what your answer is to any of those questions, um, you would have different options. But um, this, we have um, a study abroad website that, um, sorry, database that gives you, and I've just sent that in the link as well. If you click on that, it's going to take you to um, all of our pre-approved courses specifically for our majors. So um, for genetics and plant biology right now, there are 29 classes um, that count for satisfying a, a major requirement somewhere outside of the United States. And it's varied. It's in, it's, it goes from Australia to Denmark, to Costa Rica, to England, to the Netherlands, Scotland, South Korea, France. So it's like all over the place, right? So we have a bunch of coursework that you can take and still advance your degree progress while you study abroad. Um, and same, same is true for genetics plant biology, same is true for microbial biology. Um, you do get an additional, so all students are required to graduate in a total of eight semesters. Uh, if you're transferring from community college, you have an additional, you have four semesters. Um, if you study abroad, you get one additional semester to be able to fit that in. So that's fantastic. So you could conceivably just complete your, all of your major requirements in your full eight semesters or four semesters if you're a transfer student, and then just take one additional semester at the end of your spring when you were gonna graduate and take fall and say, I'm done with my major stuff. 
I'm just going to go have an experience. And you can absolutely do that. And we really, really encourage students to do that. I studied abroad in Paris when I was an undergrad. And my only regret was coming back early because I had a partner that I was <laughs> trying to impress. But um, it was fantastic. I really learned a lot. I developed as a person. I learned many things about myself I wouldn't have learned if I hadn't done that. So I really encourage other students to do it. And my personal experience had nothing to do with my major. I just went and learned a bit of French, which I've since uh, forgotten, but I'm very good at um, French movies if there's subtitles. <laughs> uh, but anyway, point being, you can study abroad with your genetics and plant biology or microbial biology degree. I 100% encourage it. You have additional time to do that if you want. And we have this um, database and website to let you know exactly what your options are. Great, thank you. So we have time for just one last question here. Um, can you describe what it would be like to minor in another subject within a different college at Berkeley? Yeah, so as I said in the beginning, I am an education minor and there's no like special forms that you have to sign. Like if you're trying to minor in LNS, there's just like the minor um, forms that you have to turn in for that specific minor as with any minor that you do, even if it's within browser. Um, I would say that the education minor has one of been my favorite experiences at Cal. And I highly recommend like just any STEM major to either minor like in the humanities or just take a couple courses in things like ethnic studies um, and other departments like sociology, anthropology, just because it really makes you a well-rounded scientist or engineer, whatever you become in STEM. And it's just super important um, in order for you to be able to do impactful work in the future. So I would highly recommend the education minor um, or another humanities minor on campus. Um, it's totally possible to do. The major gives you space to do that. And again, you have that one overlap between your minor and major um, so that you can finish your degree on time. Thank you. Um, so thank you all, Patricia, Rachel, Ada, Jenny, for answering our questions today. If, you, if anyone has any further questions, I've just posted contact information in the chat for, um, for Patricia and scheduling. It's all a little wonky in there, but you have some links to our web pages where you can get more information. Or if a question occurs to you later on, please do send an email. It was great having you here today. And that concludes our webinar. Thank you.